Welcome to the Evidence Hour, Bullying as a Developmental Precursor to Sexual and Dating Violence Across Adolescents. The Center for Victim Research is holding these Evidence Hour webinars to showcase broad reviews that examine issues of importance to victim service providers, advocates, researchers, and others. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dorothy Espelage from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is the researcher joining us today. And with her is Barry Rosenbluth, a longtime advocate and a training and technical assistance provider in the area of bullying and teen dating violence. I'm very excited to hear from both of them today. So Dorothy, I will turn things over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited that I'm able to give you just a brief overview of um, this review article that I worked on for several years. Um, and so uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about this review article that I worked on, but really um, have been thinking about this connection for over two decades. Um, so this research has been supported by the federal government, which is great, um, CDC and NIJ, um, but I'm required to put this in here and to say that anything that I say today are my opinions um, and not those of the federal government. Um, so I am Dorothy Espelage, and I, for the last 25 years, have studied um, bullying and other forms of youth violence. And very early on in our lab, um, we started to see the connections between those kids that engaged in high rates of bullying, um, as well as those kids that um, engaged in sexual harassment and teen dating violence. So early on, we saw this connection. And actually, to be honest, many of you are advocates. Um, we were hearing those messages from you guys on the ground doing this work. And so what we tried to do over the last so many years is to um, really work on understanding this connection between bullying involvement, both as perpetrators as victims, and then the escalation to other types of violence over time. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about um, theory and recognizing that most of these behaviors of bullying and sexual harassment is really determined by the complex context that we find um, children and adolescents situated in. So there's certainly going to be some characteristics associated with personality, um, family life, uh, who these kids hang out with, their peers, community in general, and society, right? So we take the social ecological perspective when we think about the connection between bullying and then later involvement in sexual violence, sexual harassment, and teen dating violence. But in addition to that, which could be, we all recognize that, you know, adolescents' behaviors and engagement in bullying and sexual violence, um, it's complex. But we also know that um, the ways in which kids get involved in bullying and get involved in sexual harassment really is the social interactional learning model that we've proposed. But we have very, very clearly always seen both bullying and sexual violence and teen dating violence from a gendered harassment lens. And I'm going to talk to you about those those characteristics where we see this connection between bullying and later sexual violence and teen dating violence. And so this is an overall model you'll see in the review um, and other papers that we've published. So for a very long time, we've tried to understand the complexity associated with bullying and then later involvement in sexual violence and teen dating violence. But ultimately in this model, and we're not going to have time to unpack all of this, but we do know from our work that the family context matters, right? Everyone's probably shaking their head. Absolutely, it matters. So we do see a connection between child abuse, exposure to domestic violence, um, and bullying involvement. We also see that connection also within the sibling relationships. Uh, one of the most pre potent predictors of bullying perpetration is really the aggression, that serious aggression among siblings. We also then see that that contributes to some anger issues, lack of emotion regulation, impulsivity, drug and alcohol use, delinquency, which is then associated with bullying, 
And then I'm going to document this a little bit here. And that then leads to sexual harassment perpetration and sexual violence, more sexual assault, as well as these types of interactions then play out within the teen dating violence um, relationships. So I'm going to show you just very some take home messages from our longitudinal study um, where we tracked um, uh, some 3,549 middle school students from fifth and sixth grade all the way through high school. Um, and in a recent study that we also did in Colorado, we're finding very, very similar um, validations and convergence of these data. OK, so just to uh, just. To, because when we started doing this work, oftentimes people, you know, there's not a lot of uh, researchers like myself that have been brave enough to go in and talk to middle school kids about sexual violence. Um, but we're going to hear from Barrios, who's done br brilliant work in this area. So you can imagine there's always pushback. Like, why are you going to talk to fifth and sixth graders about sexual harassment? Um, let's recognize that there's actually a federal law that requires that, but there is quite a bit of pushback. And early on, they would argue that, you know, really bullying is the problem. Sexual harassment really is a workplace issue and kids don't engage in those types of behaviors. I show this because when we do fancy statistics, we find that 12 percent of both you know, this in a binary sense. We didn't ask nine binary back in this study, but 12 percent report engaging in high rates of bullying on a regular basis, um, not lifetime, but like in the last month. But when we ask them whether or not they've uh, directed homophobic epithets to their peers, we find that this is much more common. Um, and we've replicated that even during um, in 2020 prior to uh, schools shutting down. So one out of three boys say that they direct homophobic epithets like that's so gay, don't be this. And you can imagine the terminology on a regular basis. But we also see that the females also contribute to this um, type of behavior as well. So homophobic name calling, which is a form of sexual harassment, is quite prevalent in our schools. And when we have teachers that say, well, they don't know what that means, they know exactly what it means, and it's serving a purpose. Here, this is fancy for anybody that's in the statistics. What we also hear from our viewers is like, isn't bullying and homophobic name calling one and the same? Absolutely not. There are plenty of kids that bully that would never direct homophobic language towards others. Um, and so it is a distinct construct. What we want to understand is who are those kids that are kind of garden variety bullying? When does it become gendered for them? And that's what we're going to what we slowly unpacked in that review article that I hope you go check out. So the takeaway messages is, and you notice I put 2019, homophobic name calling is prevalent in middle school. We actually saw an increase during the last administration in homophobic name calling, as well as sexual harassment in our schools. And that's another topic. Um, but certainly, you know, the political climate contributes to the ways in which kids interact uh, around gender based harassment. Um, those kids that bully, some of them do move on to the more nuanced, gender-based, homophobic name-calling. And this last bullet, I have to say, I think I've had it on this slide for 15 years, that we have to think about bullying prevention programming and including a discussion um, around the language that marginalizes gender nonconforming, as well as gender and sexual minority. And we're going to hear from Barry about how she's been doing that for a really long time. And so that's exciting. Um, we also then know that as we track these kids into later middle school, into high school, we also find that the, the homophobic name calling is a precursor to sexual harassment, um, both verbal sexual harassment as well as sexual violence or sexual assault. Interestingly enough, that when we look at the highest rates of sexual violence perpetration across the six year study, it really is the group of kids that are engaging that dot line high bullying, as well as the high homophobic name calling. And so homophobic name calling can be addressed, right? This is a malleable. We can have conversations about the language that they use. Um, just today, we we're in elementary school asking kids how they identify um, along gender, and we have male and female and other. 
And the kids now, these are third, fourth, and fifth graders, could attack helicopter. If you don't know that, Google that. That's actually a very homophobic um, kind of word that they use, attack helicopter. Um, sometimes they also uh, say animal or alien. Um, and that's in some ways, these are third and fourth and fifth graders talking about, we did have one fourth grader yesterday that said, you mean non-binary? And I was like, yes. And so then we taught the entire class this. So um, we also have found that when you perpetrate bullying, um, we know that the perpetration of homophobic name calling and then sexual violence occurs. But also what we're finding is, and Nan Stein has really talked about just the public display of sexual harassment. So imagine you're bullying and someone's calling you a homophobic epithet. The best way to demonstrate that you are heterosexual or you're not gender nonconforming or LGBT is to sexually harass someone publicly, right? So this just kind of validates what Nan Stein talked about in her 1995 book about the public display of these behaviors. And so kind of remarkable that we're continuing to find this in our, our data sets now in 2021. Um, under that uh, review that you, that you hopefully you read and you absorbed and hopefully you'll go back to it, we also have identified some ma other malleable factors. So traditional masculinity ideologies, um, is associated with the escalation of bullying to sexual violence. And certainly we can think of Plex work dating back 25 years of multiple masculinities and talking about non-traditional masculinity ideology. For those boys, especially boys, it's there for both males and females, but it's very strong in that a kid who's engaging in bullying in fifth and sixth, seventh grade will go on to engage in sexual violence perpetration, especially when they feel that girls need to act a certain way and boys need to act a certain way. We also have found that in many of our studies that girls and boys are quite dismissive of sexual harassment. And when they're dismissive of that, they're more likely to tolerate that type of behavior. Um, and then it continues. It's also important to know, and this is one of the papers here, is that teachers continue to be quite dismissive about sexual harassment and still a lot of victim blaming happening in our middle schools and high schools. Take home messages here. There are strong longitudinal associations among bullying, homophobic bantering, and sexual harassment perpetration. For boys, we really do find that that homophobic name calling is driving the escalation from bullying to sexual violence. Again, I'll say this, we have to take a comprehensive approach to understand how it is that we are allowing spaces for both boys and girls to be dismissive of this behavior. And really, where, how are we allowing these perpetrators the license to perpetrate this? How are we contributing as teachers and administrators in the building by not being Title IX compliant, by not putting sexual harassment uh, prevention materials into the classroom. Um, and we really need to think about uh, counteracting these perceptions of gender nonconformity. And this is a real deal here. Research should consider these multiple contexts and longitudinal. This is really, really strong work. And I, my bullet is here again. Bullying prevention programs, if they want to be relevant, they have to include discussions around gender based name calling gender-based harassment, sexual violence, and gender expression. And I would argue that we need to do that as early as possible, which is always a challenge out in the schools. So we started with this model, um, but I also want to just recognize that we are continuing to try to understand what other variables and what types of prevention efforts and what it needs to look like. So. We just had another paper that showed that sexual harassers, perpetrators in high school, were very connected. They had lots of friends. They had high social status. Those that reported engaging in sexual assault or rape actually were quite isolated. And so we have to take that into consideration when we do prevention programs, especially when we involve youth. We have to think about how do we diffuse those messages to stop bullying and sexual harassment, but how are we gonna to get to the isolated sexual assault perpetrators? 
We also have found in our work that a lot of the prevalence of sexual harassment and teen dating violence can be linked to the lack of the policies to promote healthy relationships. Um, where we see less of this is where there is attention to Title IX, good prevention programming, comprehensive sex ed. Um, and we also have a series of studies looking at the, the role of sports. Um, and we had a paper come out that showed, a couple papers that actually showed the more contact, more physical contact in a sport like football, we, we find more sexual harassment perpetrators, um, especially among boys sports teams. And then um, in the article, there's other, you know, I'm going to segue here to my dear colleague, Barry, and we have to think about what are the characteristics of effective programming. So the involvement, as I said, of the leaderships of the community members, and that includes the youth themselves, um, sufficient dosage, like if it's a diffusion and we're involving youth, how long do we have to actually consider? What is the messaging? How long does it take? Because Sexual harassment's been around for a really long time, and if these perpetrators are have high social capital and high social status, how are you going to shift that? It has to be sufficient dosage. We have to think about interpersonal skills and healthy relationships. We've done a lot of work in the area of bystander approaches, um, and they're, they're limited in their reach, but I think it also really depends on implementation and implementation fidelity. Um, and making sure that we have those bystanders that have the influence to shift the norm within a classroom, within a school, within a community. Multi-level strategies, right? We haven't even really talked about the family context. So what are the multi-level strategies that we can think about? And then ultimately, as we think about a pandemic, but also the racial pandemic, understanding that much of this behavior, although it's gendered, is really rooted in societal systems of oppression, um, and we need to think about dismantling them. And what I'd like to do now is to turn it over to my colleague, Barry, um, and I will do that. Okay. All right, Barry. Thank you, Dorothy. And hello, everybody. I'm Barry Rosenbluth. I'm the former senior director for the Inspect Respect program. Uh, at the Safe Alliance in Austin, Texas, and I have recently retired after 30 plus years in that role. And I'm just so happy to be with you all today. Thank you, Susan and Dorothy, for inviting me. Um, I'll be sharing some uh, thoughts from a practice perspective. Next. So I thought I'd start with telling you how I first, when I first became aware of what's now being called the bully sexual violence pathway. It was in the early 90s, actually, when um, our program at SAFE, formerly Safe Place, was providing its school-based support groups in middle and high schools for youth who were involved in abusive dating relationships. And at that time, um, it was not unusual for elementary school counselors and teachers to, to reach out for similar services on their campuses. They were seeing behaviors that they characterized as aggressive, as sexualized, and which they um, identified as early dating uh, abuse, pre, maybe even pre-dating abuse among elementary school students. So um, when in um, 96, the CDC issued a request for proposals to implement a, um, propose and implement and evaluate a, a prevention program for intimate partner violence, we jumped on it. And we began to look for a curricula that addressed those behaviors among elementary school students. Uh, we discovered Bully Proof, which had, which had just been published in 96. And um, if you're not familiar with Bullyproof by Nance Dunn and colleagues at the Wellesley Center for Research on Women, this is a curriculum that's designed for fourth and fifth grade students. It introduces bullying, uh, the term bullying, as a way to introduce sexual harassment. And uh, through a series of lessons and interactive experiences, students are in, uh, engaged in creating a more gender equitable learning environment. 
So this, uh, I highly recommend it, by the way. And I, we use this curriculum in a multi-level approach in six elementary schools with six matched comparison schools. Um, surrounding the lessons for fifth graders in the classroom, we included staff training, policy development, so that there were effective responses to the behaviors, parent education and support services for the school counselor. So this was, um, oh, and, and that's how Dorothy and I met was uh, for several years after the completion of the project and some of the publications that um, came from it, we held uh, uh, conferences called From Bullying to Battering, uh, School-Based Strategies for Preventing Bullying, Sexual Harassment, and Teen Dating Violence. And Dorothy graciously accepted our invitation in 2003 to be one of the featured speakers. And, and, that be, and the rest is history. So um, next, please. So I'd like to um, focus on two points uh, that I think are particularly interesting and relevant to our practice um, of, of violence prevention. And that is the concept of dominance behavior. So the, the article clearly establishes this bully sexual violence pathway that shows that these behaviors exist on a developmental continuum. Um, and, but, it goes further, uh, I, I felt, to bind these all together by their underlying motivation, dominance, to attain and obtain and maintain dominance. And in that way, these become not so much separate problems, but uh, you know, different expressions of a bigger problem. And hence the elephant here that people are touching different parts of. Um, and Although this is a developmental continuum, I think practitioners uh, well know that these behaviors and experiences happen simultaneously. Uh, they don't, the bullying doesn't stop in elementary school and suddenly it becomes sexual harassment. What we have is a kind of cumulative effect of abuse in students' lives um, as they uh, progress through adolescence. Now, I think what's also really interesting about, about the article is that um, Charthy relates these to societal systems of oppression because we know these don't occur in a vacuum. These behaviors are occurring in the context of all of these and other forms of oppression that youth experience in their school, in their community. And the relation, these, the dominance behaviors are used to not only, um, pardon me while I find my words that I wanted to share, that they contribute to maintaining these systems and that they are supported by these systems. So they contribute to and they are maintained by these uh, systems of oppression, uh, just creating a tangled web um, for, for prevention, for the field of prevention. Next, please. And I, I couldn't say it any better than this quote from the article, prevention program, programming deployed in schools and other youth serving settings must disrupt patterns where dominance behaviors, such as bullying and sexual violence, are rewarded and instead foster cultures of collective care, empathy, and psychoeducation regarding the ways that oppressive systems shape interpersonal interactions. And this is on page seven and eight of the article. So as preventioners, prevention practitioners, um, what do we do? How can we prevent behaviors that are supported by the very systems of oppression in our world? Um, what would a multi-level, you know, look, approach look like and, and why is a multi-level approach needed? Clearly these are complex behaviors and we need many voices and strategies targeting different audiences in a school community. So I'll share with you some examples from the Expect Respect program that, um, that we used and continue to use to um, create this culture of respect and care and empathy in a in a school um, first 
the support support groups for youth who have been exposed to violence. Early on, we felt that this was a good use of limited resources to provide an intensive skills-based program for students who are most vulnerable, most marginalized, and are struggling most with their peer relationships. Um, so these support groups happen on campus during the school day. And then we knew that engaging youth as leaders and influencers would be the only way that we could make any impact in the climate, in the culture of, the, of, the, uh, of, of other youth and of the adults on the campus. The third primary component includes school policy and training and technical assistance to help schools and parents address these issues, have more conversation, and respond more effectively to the uh, realities of abuse in children's lives. Next, please. Okay. Um, as Sarathi mentioned, sufficient dosage is really important. We know that even a great, you know, succession program may not be enough to change behaviors among the general population, but we do feel like those students who need it most can benefit from a, a longer term intervention. Um, in our case, we offer a 24 session support group intervention for middle and high school students who have risk factors, uh, including exposure to violence. And in the elementary schools, we offer a 16 session um, age appropriate uh, equivalent. The support groups are led by a uh, counselor or social worker employed by SAFE, the SAFE Alliance, and they are held weekly during the, uh, during the school day. And these are some of the topics. It's a very skills-based, experiential program, so students who, um, who need the, the safety and confidentiality of a place to heal from what they've experienced, but also to practice and learn new skills in the safety of a group setting. Next, please. Um, there are so many ways to engage youth leaders and influencers. We've been successful in Austin in partnering with arts-based organizations and um, offering a citywide youth theater ensemble that performs for younger students, um, engaging artists and musicians and uh, working with youth in the summer as a paid job training program. So in these ways, we're, we're looking to, to youth who know best about the forms of abuse that affect them and uh, what they need on campus to feel safe, to feel welcome, and to succeed in school. Next. Um, another component that Dorothy mentioned is the involvement and leadership of community members. These uh, are all the different ways that our uh, victim service agencies partner with other organizations, uh, other disciplines, um, high profile community leaders, such as athletes and coaches, law enforcement, um, healthcare providers, and, and other community partners to create a community that responds and prevents um, and recognizes that, these, that, that the lines between those are often blurred and we have to do both. Uh, and I'll just say about, uh, next please. Uh, the community-wide strategies are often the most difficult to maintain, right? But they can be short. We don't need sufficient dosage in a big high profile event or a theater performance. We, these are supplemental to our more intensive interventions and therefore um, allow different voices that speak to different, uh, you know, populations in the community so that we can all be um, creating a collective vision of a safer and more just society. So the multi-level interventions in the real world are really hard to evaluate because they're unique to each community. They rely on opportunities that happen locally, they rely on local champions, 
Um, they ebb and flow, they come and go with new funding that comes and goes or that, uh, uh, and disruptions uh, in that. But they're highly collaborative and they evolve over time. They take time, they take teamwork, they're staff intensive. Um, but uh, these, these sorts of strategies together have the power to, uh, to make, to change social norms, which is the path I believe we need to move forward. In. And I think that brings me to the end of my section. And we would love to take some questions and answers and have some more discussion about the article and any insights uh, you would like to share. Thank you so much. All right, thank you both for that, uh, for that overview. Folks, uh, remember you can enter your questions in the chat box and we already have a few, but I'm gonna start out with, with mine. So you both talked about this 10 year review and you cited, um, you know, that some of some of this knowledge has really been it some, feels like something we keep relearning. Where do you both come down on the continuum of frustration to hope? <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, so I did most of my work that I presented here in the state of Illinois. And so um, I'm very hopeful in the state of Illinois because administrators and families wanted us to do this work. I'm frustrated because now I live in North Carolina. And so I have to start all over. The political climate is different. There's major pushback of just when they hear sexual harassment or sexual violence, they hear sex. So I'm just, but this is where I need to do my work, right? So then I have to be hopeful that we'll be able to, to do this work. Um, I didn't realize how privileged I was to be up in Chicago and Illinois, where people were very open to doing this work. So, so I'm in between. I am maximum frustration and maximum hopefulness uh, at the same time. I feel like um, the more I see us sliding back to um, more more hateful attitudes and behaviors in our in our culture the more I, important i think this work is and that this is not the time to let up or or step back in any way um, we need to push forward we need to be a presence we need to be a constant voice nothing happens overnight this is a um you know this is a lifelong effort and many of my colleagues uh, at safe and around the, the country um, would have it, you know, no other way, and, and, and I support that. Absolutely. All right, another question. Um, what aspects of this research is getting the most traction or attention, both from those working in violence prevention or from, from researchers? So Not I questions. <laughs> no, no, no. And I think that I was just so thrilled when you emailed and said, I would like to to bring you on and let's talk about this article. And what about bringing Barry on? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I haven't talked to Barry in so long. So I'm just excited that this was on your radar. Um, this then led to an invite at a trauma conference in April. So some, for some reason, it's getting traction. That makes me very hopeful. Um, I have to say, and I'd love to hear what Barry has to say about it, because I wasn't taught, we weren't communicating during the Me Too movement. And so talk about frustrating, although I, I'm, it's great that Hollywood put it on the map for us, despite the fact that we'd done this work for so long. Um, but then it kind of went away, right? So there's always this, like, everybody's getting worked up about something, we're doing something, and then it goes away. And so I feel I have to also say that this work has gone global. It's gone international. There are in some countries where they've never measured sexual harassment or sexual violence or gender-based harassment, and they're measuring it now. So the, the research is taking hold. Um, I would just like to see more prevention. I'd like to see more of Barry's work out there that's scaled up. Um, and yeah, so that's 
I don't know, Barry, where you were when they announced the Me Too movement. But. Well, I'm not sure, and I'm not sure it trickled down to young people as much as uh, we would have liked. But they have their own, they have their own voices, they have their own issues, and we need to do more listening, and we need to do more amplifying of what they see as the problem, what they see as the solutions. Um, we really need to recognize that they need to shape. Uh, the next steps of um, of creating the, this culture of respect that we all so badly need and deserve. We got a question about a, a particular challenging situation. Uh, Meg writes, one of our middle schools is kicking us out of their school currently because a parent is complaining about the curriculum and the school is folding to the parent. Um, any advice? Mm. I'll speak to this. Um, this is why it's so critical to have those uh, long-term trusted relationships with our with school district personnel. Um, we need to be able to contact someone in the central office and explain the situation. Or if the complaint came through the central office, we need to be for them to contact us and say, "Hey, this is what's going on. Let's find a solution." Um, we need to help schools explain the value of this, uh, the, the 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 critical value of violence prevention activities and to the safety of not only their individual student but to the overall you know, climate and success of the school, that these are essential um, skills that students need, that they need to know how to treat others. It's a, it's a job readiness skill, if, if nothing else. Um, it's, it's a skill for life. And I think if parents have an opportunity to express their, their um, feelings, there, there's, maybe there's room for some common ground. Yeah, so that scenario happens all the time um, to my team. Um, sometimes they call the news. Sometimes they really, really take it further than you could think. Um, we've been successful of trying to partner with other uh, powerful parents um, within those schools to try to reverse that. Um, we've called in those parents to explain because sometimes they just simply don't understand what we're trying to do, what the purpose of this is. Um, and again, I, I don't know exactly what the situation is. Is it, is it comp sex ed that they're having problems with? Is it this idea that you're talking about non-binary um, and that's upsetting them? Because, you know, if you have a discussion about gender and sexual minority individuals, will that their children then come home and say, I think I'm bisexual? And that's usually a cause for concern, too. So I think trying to engage in a conversation. I've had phone calls with parents that are very irate about, like, why would you even do this? We do this social, emotional, and violence prevention in my home. And then by the time that we have this conversation, and I say that I understand, okay, you might do this in your home, but your child is going to be sitting next to someone that may not have that messaging. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and then sometimes you just can't, sometimes that parent is so powerful that it's unfortunate. The other thing is, and so in high schools, a lot of this um, is driven by the youth. So in high schools, they will just insist that we're going to have a gender and sexual sexuality alliance, which is the new name for GSAs. So the youth have been driving that. We're seeing that increasingly with middle school students too. Huh. They have a voice too. Sixth graders, it's a little harder for them, but seventh and eighth graders, they're starting to insist that they want these type of programming. So that's another idea too. Uh, and I'll another, just add, oh. in addition to all of the positive reasons why we need this, this is a health issue. Uh, victimization is associated with so many health risk behaviors and consequences and long-term consequences um, for people's health that um, I think sometimes we just don't have enough information out there for parents to understand how this is relevant to their child. 
Right, and uh, Lois offers a comment. The parents need to support non-bullying in the schools and support the respect of one another. Uh, another question, do you have any data? Uh, this is from Brianna. Do you have any data on how the rates of sexual violence and harassment in the US compares to other first world countries? So um, a lot of those countries don't ask these questions. So oh. we don't have really good data. So sometimes they're just starting to ask these types of questions. Um, we do know that and I'll let very, we do know that in some countries where you would think, um, say I was just in Sweden, they have pretty high rates of IPV and domestic violence, um, but they also have policies that protect victims more so than we do. So it, it's, it's hard to know. They're starting just to measure this. We certainly do know that there's domestic violence in uh, these European countries and IPV, you know, less about the adolescents in these contexts. Um, Vicki writes, I think more needs to be done to let students know what dating violence really is. Some really don't know and haven't been told by their parents what healthy dating behaviors are. And I Absolutely. would say there are so many good resources now mm -hmm. out there um, for, for youth and for parents and for schools. So it would not uh, take many clicks to find um, wonderful conversation guides and curricula and videos and um, tools for talking with teens is the name of one I'm uh, particularly fond of um, from JWI uh, that is uh, available for free and can be um, viewed online and shared with others. So um, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, and I think it's um... You know, I do even this work with my university students tomorrow. I'm presenting on dating violence in my class because they haven't received. You know, remember, I'm in North Carolina, so they haven't received any kind of healthy relationship curriculum. Um, and so what they're challenged with is the different types of violence. Right. So you can have the situational violence within the dating relationship where conflict escalates to violence. But there's also this which we talk less about, and that's that coercive part where it's just that dominating behavior that Barry was talking about. But it, it, but it's not as obvious as the, the, the situational violence. There's just this coercive strategies that are happening and you find yourself like, is that violence? Hmm. So we need to do more of that in early on as kids are dating. Um, yeah, and, and then another important piece I want to add to that, Dorothy, is helping young people know how to talk to their friends because they may be the first or only to, to be aware that someone is in, you know, in an abusive relationship. And um, we need to give them some tools for uh, expressing their concern to their friend or offering to go with them to get to get some help or confronting a friend who they see being harassing or abusive. In a, in a way that's um, productive. So um, these are all important relationship and life skills that should be part of every student's education. Sarah asks, do you have experience working with the deaf culture in this area? I can share that at the SAFE Alliance, we have um, a, a wonderful deaf services program um, and ed educators and counselors who work with um, young with students at our Texas School for the Deaf, using the Expect Respect curriculum in small groups and in classroom settings and in teacher training, uh, because this is um, this is an important topic for everybody and is relevant for for everybody, hearing and uh, hearing impaired. Yeah, so we do. We also do quite a bit of work with other disabled populations as well. Um, and so, and we see high rates of intimate partner violence and teen dating violence among this group. Again, you've got to remember that's you know the minority stress theory and the marginalization, um, and then the complexity of understanding, for example, what is abuse when you may be you know on the spectrum of autism, right? So, what does that look like? Um, how do we encourage them to report um, and then we also are finding high rates of teen dating violence again gender and sexual minority youth and some brilliant qualitative research out there on why it is that 
gender and sexual minority youth would report higher rates of teen dating violence. And I'll give you just a few, so many times when they partner, um, especially if they're in a rural area where the, the, the dating partners, there's not as many, that they just, they stay in abusive relationships because they think that they're not going to find someone else. Remember, they're also just adolescents, right, in relationships. Um, or they have internalized uh, homophobia themselves, um, or they just also haven't been, you got to remember, most of the teen dating violence uh, literature and prevention programming really doesn't even represent, include the discussions around anything beyond heterosexual relationships, too, is a cause for concern. But absolutely, we do know that some of these marginalized and the intersections of these mar these identities as well places them at more risk for these types of outcomes in youth violence. Yeah. Aurelia writes, I believe there's more hope in prevention education, educating young people than adults. Many times the parents don't even know what domestic violence and IPV mean. Absolutely. Yes, and if these behaviors are modeled at home, um, it's it's so much more likely that a young person will find themselves both a perpetrator and or a victim of dating abuse. So there is a strong correlation there, and we know that um, that this uh, you know that we learn, like uh, the ecological model shows us, we we are influ our behavior is influenced at all those different levels. Yeah, we just have a paper under review now where we measured adverse childhood experiences, including exposure to domestic violence, uh, sexual abuse, and these are middle school kids, sexual abuse as well as physical abuse. And the, as you imagine, the count of the ACEs as that goes up, the risk for SV perpetration and teen dating violence goes up as well. Brianna is asking, do you know if there's a correlation between those who are sexually harassed as adolescents being more likely to end up in toxic and abusive relationships as adults. Ad health data, which is a large, large data set, um, it shows this. They've tracked, yes, absolutely. So, it, and we are talking about them as uh, David Finkelhorst talked to them about as poly victims. Uh -huh. And so we have shown in that 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 with that ad health data that if you experience both bullying victimization as well as relationship abuse. Um, as an adolescent, you're more likely to then be both a perpetrator and victim in your adult relationships. Elizabeth says, I work with juvenile justice youth, uh, raid, uh, teen dating, violence prevention, and sexting. Lately, each time they mention how many women are falsely reporting rape. I give them the stats, but how can I better address this? Wow. Okay, so I commend you. You're, this is great. This is wonderful that that you're that you're working with this population that so sorely needs this prevention programming, and the sexting is really a cause for concern because that will, you know, in many states, just sending a sex can actually put you on a sex offender list, right? Um, so, Barry, you want to take the false accusation one? Well, um, I would say it's very likely that your students in a criminal justice setting are um, victims and witnesses of multiple forms of abuse themselves. And, um, and, and I think this speaks to the need to create more uh, opportunities for youth who have been exposed to violence to have a small group, confidential, therapeutic support group intervention in which they can reveal and explore and um, you know their own histories of abuse because it's really hard to uh, I, I know exactly uh, what you're describing it's there's a defensiveness mm -hmm. and certainly there are cases uh, of false reporting um, that occur but I think that the bigger issue here is that young people particularly those who are most vulnerable need that support group intervention or small group setting where they can go deeper into their own personal experiences as they discuss these issues so that they can uh, empathize um, with other victims um, like themselves and, yeah, and Mary, ultimately, think, ultimately, ultimately yeah. to let go of some of that self-blame and some of that harm 
that continues from, uh, you know, from not being able to express the pain that is caused by, by that abuse they've had in their lives. Yeah, and Barry, that makes me think of some of Liz Miller's work with um, out in Pittsburgh, who's doing quite a bit of work um, with the faith-based organizations to talk to African-American adolescents um, around kind of this abuse. So I encourage you to look up Elizabeth Miller at Pitt. Uh, Randy is asking, is there a way to receive the slide material and information to share with uh, the team, which gives me the opportunity to remind people, if you take that feedback survey right after the webinar, that's where you can request a copy of the slides and a certificate of participation. Stefania is asking, what recommendations do you give to serve the Latinx community better, especially mm -hmm. domestic violence and sexual assault organizations where the majority of the employees are, are white? More, cultur more, more culturally uh, responsive uh, staff and, and methods and materials and Spanish and opportunities for people to share similar lived experiences with others from their culture. Because um, one thing that we, we learned in early on in our delivering our support groups in schools is that each uh, person representing a different culture thinks this is unique to their culture. Um, that that uh, sexual violence, sexual harassment, domestic violence is more of a problem in their culture. And I think it's very uh, healing and eye-opening when they begin to recognize that uh, this happens across cultures and it's uh, they're not to blame. Yeah, and we're increasingly looking at protective factors associated with um, TDV and also other forms of violence for Latinx adolescents. And we're finding that spirituality, family, so we have eight sources of strength that we look at um, and just building those protective factors within the school communities and the communities outside of the school and leveraging that community connection, um, you know, but also dismantling the, the oppressed system within even that culture itself, right? So, but there are ways to create protection. And there are some very uh, good culturally specific resources online that, that can be identified as well. Great. Um, I, I should just jump in here and say, Barry or Dorothy, if you have additional sources or uh, recommendations to make, we can send those out when we send out the link to, the, um, to this webinar. Chloe is asking, what would the first step be in a community organization reaching out to a school or school system with the intention of educating the youth on sexual assault and domestic violence? Where do you start? I would uh, contact the school district superintendent, perhaps, and ask to meet to discuss Title IX issues. This is um, a responsibility of every school district that receives federal funding um, to ensure a safe, gender equitable learning environment. And so um, I think that is the person who might have the most authority in. Um, you know, in, in welcoming in a new program, but it's gonna take more than just opening the door. There's going to be a role for uh, multiple parties. And I think this is where a series of conversations at, at that level could help identify what, what, what does this look like on, in our schools? What does sexual harassment look like in our schools? Um, who are the targeted students? Where is it happening? And, um, and, and for parents to offer uh, you know, to to support a, a, a multi-level intervention. Yeah, I would add that it really is about building community and relationships, and it's not going to happen overnight. But I also think it's important to, you know, if you have some YRB some data, you know, is there some data that would argue for having that meeting? 
um, would they be willing to collect their own data, maybe working with the youth to design a survey? Um, because sometimes they will say, well, we don't really have that bullying problem here. The kids don't sexually harass one another. And then we survey their kids and they come back where there's multiple victims and perpetrators um, and finding out where it's happening, who are the targets and really understanding. And from our research, we also know that unfortunately the adults engage in these behaviors as well and they, they model these behaviors. Um, when a school is Title IX compliant, we see less sexual harassment and homophobic name calling and less teen dating violence. So there's something about a recognition and awareness that it's their obligation to create a safe space for all kids and to prevent violence and promote healthy relationships. We actually see that there's lower rates there. So. Mm -hmm. And Lois actually echoes what you just said, uh, that there that this is a learned behavior, so that if adults are modeling poor behavior, um, that, that that's aggravating the, the problem. Um, but Dorothy, you, you also just mentioned working with the youth to develop a survey. Can you say more about that, about the need to work with youth as partners? Yeah, I think it's important because their language is different than the language we even understand, right? Like I was just surveying third through fifth graders all week and they were using language that I had to have. It. Some kid was like, I'm busting. I was like, what's that mean? So I think that the ways in which we ask these questions, unfortunately, in the sexual harassment area, we've continued to just use the AAUW survey that was put out like 20 years ago. Things have changed. Um, social media uh, is used, the sexting. So, um, and the kids know. Uh, and we can also sometimes we will we will work with either a social justice class in a high school to do this, or we'll work in with a math club and we'll talk about quantitative literacy. So, you know, they're doing this project. They're developing a survey. They may uh, actually help us you know, graphically depict that, present it back to, it's really hard when you have high school students come in and say, this is what, what the students are saying for the adults to not respond. Um, we also used photo voice very effectively with a group of students um, in health science class in a high school and also in a summer program. So where they're taking pictures and writing narratives about uh, of the images in their community that, um, that they would like to see improved um, and conditions they would like to see improved and then to present that to faculty and administrators was very empowering and um, resulted in some some positive change that's great it's great to to close on some really exciting uh, work especially involving involving the youth like like you both just did so the audience is expressing their gratitude for this webinar. I have really learned a lot and I want to thank both of you for this. Um, I, and Barry, for your long career in this area, thank you so much. Dorothy, we're gonna be looking for that next article that you said you're, um, you're getting ready to submit. And um, for our audience, thank you so much for joining us today and learning about all of this. So with that, I'll close our webinar and um, hope to see you all again sometime soon.